Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. In the good, in the bad times, come on. In the shadow, in the sunlight, it's my joy for my whole life to praise your name. Come on, this song is real simple. Let's testify. In the good, in the bad times, yeah. In the shadow, in the sun, come on, you got it. It's mine. It's my joy.
power that we can trust and have confidence and peace. No matter what we see, no matter what it looks like, he's working it all together for our good. Church, lift your voice, sing. I don't wanna be afraid every time I face the way. Oh, I don't wanna be afraid. Oh, I don't wanna be afraid. I don't wanna fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't wanna fear the storm. No, I don't wanna fear the storm. Lift your voice with me. Peace, be still. Say the word, and I will send my feet upon the sea until I'm dancing in the deep. Oh, peace, be still. You are here, so it is well. Even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. together that I'm not gonna be afraid cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm far greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm
Come on, lift your hands if you're ready to receive that peace tonight. The peace that surpasses all understanding is in this room tonight. We need your peace. We need your peace. Yes, we do, Lord. We receive. We receive your peace tonight. Your peace tonight in every home, in every situation. We receive your peace. We receive it. God, we know and we believe that you want to do something powerful in us tonight. We've lifted up your name. We've honored and exalted you, God. Come have your way. Holy Spirit, come have your way. Bless every heart. Open every mind to receive the truth of your word. Father, we're ready for you to pour your truth, your power into our hearts, into our lives. God, we love you. We thank you, Lord. And tonight we lean in to everything that you have for us. We don't wanna leave anything on the table, God. Every truth, every speck, we wanna bring it all. Have your way. Church, would you just say that? Say, Lord, have your way. Father, have your way. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, let's, let's put our hands together. Let's get excited by the goodness of our God. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome to First Wednesday, everybody. Woo! Man, it is so, so good to be here with you tonight. Every time Pastor Q gives me the opportunity to share God's word, I, go, I get so excited. I'm so thankful for him as my pastor. Uh, I'm so thankful for this church as my family. And I'm thankful that God's word changes lives. Amen? Yeah. Are you ready to lean in tonight? It's gonna be so good, man. That powerful worship, powerful worship. I actually wanna talk about that song right there. 
that song, <laughs> yeah, me too. That song was incredible. This song really moved me. We were doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. We were having this time of prayer uh, a couple of Saturday mornings ago, and I was standing right over here in the worship center just praying, me and Jesus, and they began, the worship team began to play this song. And uh, it felt like this story popped into my heart, and I have not been able to think of very much else since then. So I'm really excited to share what God has been showing me as I've looked at this really popular uh, passage of Scripture that I'm sure you're familiar with. Tonight I want to talk about Peter and Jesus. I want to talk about Peter and Jesus as they walked on the water. I have read that story, heard that story. I'm, I'm a pastor's kid, so I, like that was my breakfast. Like I, I, like I know the story so well. But I've seen some things recently that I just never saw before. And I want to invite you to lean in with me tonight as we open our hearts and receive all that God has. Amen. We're going to find the story in Matthew chapter 14. Let's start reading together. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. See, the disciples and Jesus had just finished feeding 5,000 people miraculously with loaves and fishes. And Jesus sends the disciples in the boat out into the water to fish. And he goes away to pray. And there's a storm that rolls in in the fourth watch of the night. And the waves and the wind are howling. And Jesus decides to take a little stroll, everybody. He comes walking out on the water. And the word says that the disciples were terrified. They didn't know what was going on. They recognized that it was Jesus. And this is what happened. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he, Peter, saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And this is where I stop in my tracks because I have said this very phrase, Lord, save me. Anybody with me here tonight where you've had something happen in your life? You feel like there was a storm, there was a wind, there was a wave, there was something that was causing you a level of discomfort. And you just said, Lord, save me. It happens. This is why the Bible is so applicable to life right now today. This is a story that happened thousands of years ago. Yeah, right now today, it applies to my life and your life right now. He cries out and says, save me. Why? It's interesting. I have a question just because I, Pastor Q has trained us so well to ask really good questions about the word, hasn't he? Right? So here's my first question when I read this. Um, how do you see wind? How? How do you see wind? In the waves. You see wind in the waves. See, when Peter says, I saw the wind, and he began to be terrified, what he's meaning is the wind was blowing so strongly that the waves were crashing over him. He could see the effect of the wind moving the waves. Now, I love to go to the beach when we go to Cape Canaveral. My wife and I, we love the Space Center. We love to go there with the kids, and we'll go to the beach that's right there. You can see the launch pads, and uh, we'll go, and we'll get in the water. And that, listen, the East Coast is different than the West Coast. Uh, and when I'm talking about the waves, the East Coast is different than the West Coast. I came with a West Coast mentality and uh, came back drenched uh, East Coast style. So um, I'm a big man. I don't often get pushed around, but I walked into the water on that beach and I got manhandled by nature. I, I just got tossed. It was outside of my control. It was pushing me. I, there was nothing I could do. I was at the mercy of the waves. Have you felt that in your life? When you look at your spouse, when you look at your kids, when you look at your finances, when you look at your emotions or your anxiety or your depression, do you just feel like there's nothing I can do about it? Because this is how Peter felt. Pushed outside of our safety, outside of our comfort, outside of our control. That's how you know it's a wave. It's outside of your control and it's knocking you all over the place. Peter cries out, save me, because he can see the wind, and the wind is moving the waves, and the waves are moving him. There's nothing left for him to do but to cry out, save me. And the verse continues to say this. Jesus immediately reached out his hand. What did Jesus immediately do? What did he do? Reached out his hand, and he took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And listen to what happens. Those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. See, what I think is incredible about this portion of scripture is this passage right here changed Peter's perspective of Jesus. 
After this event, after this circumstance, when Peter looked at Jesus, Peter saw him differently than he did before because of what had happened. He changed Peter's view because how we see Jesus dictates what we can receive from him. How we see Jesus dictates what we can receive from him. This is a powerful portion of scripture where Peter and Jesus had a relationship before and then they had this encounter. They had these winds, this wind and this wave and this desperation and this save me, Lord. And then after that, things were different. Peter saw Jesus in a new light. How we see Jesus dictates what we can receive for him. Because listen, culture would say that Jesus is a good man. In history, he's a good man. Okay, well, if Jesus is just a good man, then he can really only be just a good example. Some would say, oh, Jesus, he's got just such sage wisdom. Well, if that's all Jesus is to you, if that's all, if that's the only way that you can see him, he will only ever be someone who can give you good advice. But if you and I can see him as God, if you and I can see him as Savior, then he will be anything and everything that we need to accomplish the mission he has set us here to do. How we see him dictates what we can receive him. If he's not God, I don't know that I can get my supply from him or my strength from him or my hope from him or my confidence from him or my joy or my peace from him. And in this story, Peter's view shifts wildly. So the question is, what is our view? Take a minute and think. When I think of Jesus... How do I see him? How do I view him? Is he my friend or is he my savior? Is Jesus just a talker or is he my teacher? Is Jesus just somebody who suggests things or is Jesus my master? One of my favorite verses of all time describes something really difficult for us as believers and followers who want to be mature, who want to be growing. It lays out this recipe for success. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. One of the most difficult things that you and I will ever have to do is in all of our ways acknowledge him. In all of my thoughts, acknowledge him and what he would want. In all of my actions, acknowledge him and what he would want. In all of my speaking and words, in all of my posting, what would he want? To sacrifice our self-supremacy and be submissive to the Savior. Are you kidding me? That's hard. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And look at what happens. If we will just take the time to leave space for God to speak into our lives, guess what happens? He will make straight your paths. You will end up where you need to be according to his plan, according to his will. Being in God's perfect will isn't about receiving this incredible download of information. It's about getting in the Bible and living the Bible. And when you do that, you will end up where God wants you to be. It's right there. I promise. I didn't change it at all. This equals total dependence on God. And when we are totally and completely dependent on God and who he is, that's where we end up where God wants us to be. Our view of him dictates what we can receive from him. And so this story that I've read so many times and heard so many times and watched on different videos and cartoons, like I have seen this story every which way, flannel graph, yes, PowerPoint, yes, McGee and me, yes, I have seen it all. But I never saw this. What Jesus does in this six to eight verses is miraculous and incredible. And I can tell you what he did, but I never understood the wisdom of the timing and the order in which he did it. I want to prove two things real quick. Can I prove two things? Can I prove two things in the Bible to you? Is that all right? I want us to look right here at John 21, 7. Listen to what it says. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And the verse goes on to say, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. This is a totally different 
situation and story. This is after Jesus had died and resurrected. Jesus was on the beach cooking up fish. They see that it's Jesus and Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. I want to prove to you something here that's relevant to our story in Matthew chapter 14. Guess what? Peter could swim. I know it seems simple. I know it might even seem stupid, but that's just how God helps me to understand things, all right? Peter could swim. First of all, he was a fisherman. Seems pretty unwise to be a fisherman if you can't swim. But we have proof in the Bible. Peter could swim. Look at eight, Luke 8, 24 right here. This is another time where Jesus and the disciples are on the water. Jesus is sleeping in the bow of the boat. And as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. Newsflash, Jesus can calm a storm. So why didn't he? Peter had just done something incredible, an incredible act of faith by stepping out of a boat into wind and waves that were terrifying. And Peter was walking on the water. Nobody's ever done that except Jesus. But Peter starts to see the wind and the waves and he starts to sink and he cries out. He says, Lord, save me. And I find it interesting the way that the Lord saved him. Because we know that Jesus can calm a storm, right? So why didn't he? When I cry out, Lord, save me, why doesn't Jesus always stop my storm? When I'm desperate for something and I'm being tossed by a situation or emotion, a circumstance that's beyond my control and I don't feel comfortable and I don't feel safe and I cry out just like Peter did, Lord, save me, why doesn't he stop my storm? There's three things that Jesus does here that are just brilliant and they apply to our lives today. The first thing is this. Jesus doesn't bring Peter relief. He saves Peter. He rescues him. Look here. Jesus saves Peter. But when he saw the wind, Peter was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. He didn't change the storm. He didn't put his hand on the storm. He didn't stop the storm. He put his hand on his child to give him strength and stability and support. He didn't change the circumstance. He reached for his child, Peter, his creation, his beloved one. Why? Because Peter could swim. Peter had a natural ability, God-given ability, talent. He could swim. We know it. And he had the experience to do it well. I think you and I probably have some experience in life that sometimes we try to lean on our own understanding when things come up, right? Oh. See, because if you're like me, I like to look out there. Well, Lord, if you would just change that over there, I can swim. If you'll just stop the storm, oh, I can do it in my own strength. If you'll just stop what's going on with my wife, oh, I can handle it. It's not me, Lord, it's her. If you'll just change my child's mind or my neighbor's mind or my boss's mind, if you'll just change what I make, well, I can do it in my own strength. But is doing things in our own strength the way that God created us to live? No. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, in all your ways, acknowledge me. Be dependent on me. Look to me for your answers and your strength and your support and your wisdom and your direction. Look to me. I love to look out there and say, well, Lord, if you would just change that over there, I'd be fine because I can do it. I'm self-reliant, I'm smart, I'm a capable human who has created three other capable humans. Like I've got some street cred, I can do this. <laughs> but Jesus chose not to. Listen very closely, I want you to lean in. God, God, God made Peter's experience, his talent, 
his ability completely worthless in that moment because he kept the storm and the waves rolling. He didn't stop him when he could. He made all of that ability, all of that experience, all of that talent, all of that brilliance, he made it worthless so that Peter's view of God as Savior could be priceless. He's crying out, save me. And Jesus says, okay, but I'm going to do it the way that's best for you. It doesn't mean that I change your circumstances. It means that I change you. That's why the timing of this story matters. Because we know Peter can swim and we know Jesus can calm the storms, but he didn't. Because he needed Peter to see him as Savior. See, it's only when we see Jesus save us that he actually, we can see him as Savior. When God doesn't do what God could do, it means he's doing it because it's what's best for you. Because God can do anything. We've got scriptural proof from all day long of the miraculous things that our God can do. But when God doesn't do what you know he's perfectly capable of doing, it's because it's for your benefit. It's because there's a purpose in it. It's because there's a value in it for you. And I know that I'm speaking to someone tonight who's in the middle of a storm, who's uncomfortable, who's been pushed out of their ability to control, pushed out of what makes them feel safe, pushed out of what makes them feel comfortable. And you're being battered by the situation or the circumstance outside of you or within you. And you're crying out, Lord, save me. And Jesus says, okay, but I'm going to do it in a way so that you see me as Savior. Not just friend, Savior. And it was because the storm stayed that Peter began to see Jesus as Savior. So Jesus saves Peter. And the second thing is this, Jesus speaks to Peter. He says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of Peter, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus is getting on Peter's case a little bit. Hey, homeboy, don't you know who I am? What's the matter with you? The storm hasn't stopped yet. It's still going. Hurricane winds, storms, winds so heavy that you can see it reflected in the waves, tossed like a rag doll. And Peter is clinging to Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, let's take a minute. I got to talk to you about something. <laughs> Jesus wants to have a little chat. And I can see Peter like just holding on for dear life, just nestled all up there like, hi, we've been trying to reach you regarding your car's auto insurance. <laughs> like they're close, it's tight. Here's something that I noticed, Peter was terrified, but God had his full attention. He was scared out of his wits, scared out of his mind. Oh, but he was hanging on every word that came out of Jesus' mouth and his arms. He was hanging on. And here's something that I think is interesting. A lot of times when something is happening to us as believers and followers, we like to look at other people as the reason why. Well, they did this to me. And they said that to me. Or they didn't invite me. Or they didn't pick me. If I sound like a three-year-old, it's because sometimes adults sound like three-year-olds. But we love to look over there at the other people. But Jesus, when he has Peter, and he's got Peter's full attention... He's not saying, yeah, yeah, Sister Susan over there, she was so mean and unkind to you. He's, he wasn't looking at the storm or what created the storm, or he wasn't even talking to Peter about how he could have avoided the storm. He actually took the time in the middle of the storm to show Peter something about himself. Stop looking for other people when you're struggling. Stop looking to pass the blame. Stop looking to try to understand or put the blame on somebody. God sometimes just wants you to look right here because he's got a lesson for you to learn in the middle of your storm. See, Jesus calls out to him and says, hey, you don't have a storm problem, Peter. You've got a faith problem. You've got a doubt problem. And we have to address this if you're going to be all that I want you to be. If I'm going to build my church on you, Peter, we got to work on this faith. we got to work on this doubt. In the middle of the storm. If I want my kids to listen to me, I turn everything off in the house so I can have their undivided attention. Jesus took a different route. <laughs> he made it so terrifying and Peter was clinging so tightly to Jesus that Peter was actually close enough to hear what Jesus was saying. 
It's because Jesus didn't stop the storm and that Peter could see Jesus as his savior that he was close enough to hear Jesus speak so that Jesus could become his teacher. And the storm's still going. The storm has not stopped. It has continued this whole time. So I just want you to picture in your mind's eye, Jesus basically holding Peter in the middle of a hurricane. Everybody's freaking out. And he's like, look, buddy, I love you, but we're going to have to work on this. (laughs) Be careful. As one of your pastors, be careful when things are going wrong because your eye is going to want to look to other people. But Jesus wants you to see something about yourself. It's an opportunity for you and I to grow as believers and followers in maturity and in spiritual health. For Jesus to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I know Susie's a jerk. I get that. But listen, you, have, you, need, you need too much of Susie's approval. No, 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 no. I understand that you, don't, you feel like you don't have enough money. You want to do this thing and you can't do it. And you're really frustrated. It's not a money problem. It's a stewardship problem. Let's work on that. It's not the fact that your boss isn't paying you enough. It's are you being faithful with what I'm giving you? So you can blame the storm on people, but Jesus is holding you, taking you out of immediate danger so that you will cling to him so that you can hear his still small voice say, hey, we got something to work on. This is about you. I just find that brilliant and I never saw it before. He didn't stop the storm to save him so that Peter could see him as savior. He didn't stop the storm to talk to him or teach him because he needed him to be focused, full attention. Notice no, no other thing that was more important than Jesus' words and the presence of Jesus. And in that moment, he was close enough to hear his voice and Jesus became his teacher. See, God will leave the storm in place until you get into a position to listen to his voice. Amen. Amen. The storm stays to keep us close, to hear what God would say. Because if God would remove the storm, I could swim in my own strength. Or if God could remove the storm, then I might listen to some other voices that might want to say some things instead of his. But he allows the storm to stay so that he can be savior, so that he can be teacher. And the third thing that happens is this. Jesus stops the storm around Peter. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I hope that this, the truth of God's word and this message from, from Matthew 14 is resonating in your heart. Because I have lived this. I grew up in a house, like I mentioned, I'm a pastor's kid. And so uh, I just want you to know that I was raised, trained, and brought up to find my value and worth by how well I was doing things for other people. My value was solely determined on, did I do a good job leading worship? Did I do a good job speaking? Did I do a a good job leading this children's ministry? Did I do this well? Are people celebrating me? Oh, thank God, I guess I'm okay. And that might not be you, but it was definitely me. But if it's not that, it's something. (laughs) I was getting my value from other things. And then I got dropped in the middle of a storm. I came to the chapel with a godly pastor who loves me. I can't tell you how thankful I am for Pastor Q. I got a text from him before we started tonight that said, hey, I'm thinking about you. I know you're gonna crush it. Love you. Let me know how it goes. That's my pastor. And he created a safe enough environment for me to be in the middle of a storm right here with all of you. And you may not have seen it, you may not have known it, but it happened. And for the longest time, I was really excited because I could do some cool stuff and I built some cool stuff and I got celebrated and I got given opportunities and I got promoted and I got to do all that stuff. And man, I was riding the wave. And then something changed. And nobody did anything wrong. Nobody was trying to hurt me. But all of a sudden, I didn't get as much accolades or praise. And I started to think, man, what, did I do something wrong? Am I wrong? Am I bad? And I really struggled with it. I didn't know what to do. I got tossed like a rag doll by my emotions. 
I got tossed like a rag doll because of my expectations. I got tossed like a rag doll because I was trying to get my worth and value from something I was never meant to. (laughs) And God allowed the blessing of a storm. God allowed me to struggle until the only thing I could do was cry out and say, Lord, save me. And he didn't change my circumstance straight away. He didn't do it right away, no. But he began to rescue me and to save me and to change my position and to change my mind and my emotions and my thoughts to be more like his thoughts. And because I was close, because I was desperate, because I was at the end of my rope, I was just desperate enough to listen, just terrified enough to cling close to my Savior so that he could mold and shape something about me. And I'll say it again, nobody here did anything wrong. We've got an incredible staff and a pastor who loves me and my family. This is something that God brought me through. But when I was able to see him as Savior, when I was able to see him as teacher, things begin to change in me. And I started to get my value and my worth from Jesus, where it's supposed to come from. And I should know better because I was a pastor's kid and I grew up in church and I know all about the Bible, sure. Bible trivia, you're all gonna lose. (laughs) But it didn't matter because I hadn't allowed the word to get into my heart. I allowed it around my heart and I allowed it in my mind, but I didn't allow myself to live it. And when God allowed me to be in a storm so that only he could save me and only he could teach me, then things began to be different. And so now when I have the opportunity to lead, it feels very different because my confidence comes from Jesus. I'm not trying to do a good job so I can hear a good job. I'm doing a good job because God loves me so much and my value comes from him. It's a different ball game for me. So what is it for you? Because here's what's true for all of us. Our storm is shaping how we see Jesus. I know this is counterintuitive and I know it might tick you off. Fine, send me an email. Your storm is a gift. And until you see it that way, you won't reap the benefit. Your storm right now, I want you to think about it. Everybody's got something. Now, it might not be the cops are on your tail and you're going to have to get out of here early before. It might not be that drastic, but it's something. It's something. Because remember what a wave is. Something that takes you out of control. Something that threatens your safety. Something that threatens your comfort. We've all got something like that. But just realize, don't get discouraged when you cry out for God to save you. He will, but he's going to do it his way to produce his result in his creation. Amen? When Jesus stepped into the boat and then stopped the storm, the third thing that Peter saw is that Jesus was his master and that there was nothing he couldn't do. Savior, teacher, master. Savior in the storm teacher in the storm. Blessed and amazed and calling him master when the storm ends. Because when they got into the boat, what did they do? They worshiped. How you navigate your storm and how you allow God to change your view of him, when you start seeing him as savior and teacher and master, you can't help but to worship. You can't help it. And as all of us work together to be faithful in the storm and allow the storm to shape us, when you and I begin to see him as savior and teacher and master, guess what? We become better parents. We become better spouses. We become better leaders. We become better friends. We're able to move the kingdom forward in a healthy way. Tonight we have a choice. And every day we have a choice. We get to choose our perspective. Here are your options. He's either letting the storm kill you or letting the storm shape you. How you see it 
is how you'll live it. How will you choose to see what God is allowing to happen in your life? With eyes of faith or eyes of fear? See, the disciples saw and worshiped. Interesting that the storm didn't stop until they got into the boat with the other people. Kind of like getting in a group. Interesting that the storm raged while they were off on their own, doing their own thing. But as soon as they came together as a group, oh, storm stopped. Worship was inspired. Lives were changed because they were together. Little bunny trail, get in a group. Awesome. All right, moving on. (laughs) Worship is the result of a correct view of God. And so I want you to take a minute and I want you to think about whatever storm, big or small, that you're going through. And realize that when you cry out, when you come to the end of your rope and you cry out, Jesus, save me, he's going to, but in a way that causes him to be your savior, causes him to be your teacher, causes him to be your master. And when you get to that last one, you will not be able to help but to stand to your feet and lift your hands and worship our God and King. Will you stand with me tonight? In just a minute, we're gonna continue to worship. I wanna pray over you, but I don't want you to ever forget how much God loves you how much God desires to be with you and mold you and shape you by the truth and power of his word. If you will listen and lean into the power and the truth of God's word that we find in Matthew 14, you will be changed. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray for one another. Let's lean in to do the work, to not get frustrated by the storm, to not get overwhelmed by the storm, but to allow the storm to shape us because we trust God so much. The size of the storm doesn't matter. The power of my savior matters. We can stay in the middle of it as long as we're holding on to his hand. We can stay in the middle of it as long as he will rescue us and save us, not just relieve us. He will stay with us in the storm to teach us, not to tell us about everybody else, but to focus on us. He will be our teacher. He will become our master. And when he does that, you will not be able to help yourself. You won't be able to stand it. You won't be able to wait to get to church on the weekend or first Wednesday to lift your hands, to magnify our God and Savior. So let's lift our hands. Let's worship right now. Come on, let's praise his name. Come on. Oh, peace, be still. Say the word and I will set my feet upon the sea until I'm dancing in the deep. Peace, be still, you are here so it is well, even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. Oh, peace, be still, say the word and I will, set my feet upon the sea until I'm dancing in the deep. Oh, peace, be still. You are here, so it is well, even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. So let faith rise up, oh heart, believe it, let faith rise up in me, let you to shift our perspective tonight of who you are and what you can do. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise where every demon trembles where we 
proclaim your name. Yes, this is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of faith. And you have our full attention. You have the final say. Come on, we sing, come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. your house. There's resurrection power. Your blood runs through our veins. Your kingdom triumphs This is a house of miracles. 
It's your house, God. So we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house. Yes, it is. We come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Oh, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Thank you, Lord. Yes, it is. Yes, we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. God, we look to you now. We believe in your power. This is your house. And we are your people. We bring everything, not just what looks good, not just what feels right. We bring everything and give it all to you, Lord. Bring it to your feet, Jesus. And bring it to the feet of Jesus. Come on, whatever you're carrying with you right now, whatever's holding you back from pressing into the presence of God, we choose to bring it to him. This is his house. He made us. He wants to meet us here. He wants to do a miracle in our hearts, but sometimes it just change. It takes changing our perspective. It takes seeing him in a new way. It takes remembering that he's a savior, that he's a miracle worker. We search ourselves, Lord, right now. Search our hearts. Help us to bring everything to your feet, to lay everything aside, to meet you here right now. You're a miracle worker. You're a loving father. You're the savior of the world. Gave your son so we could know you. You're the healer. You set us free, you break our chains, and you gave us everything. I still believe your move, I still believe your speak. God, I believe your word, all things for good. So I'll fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I still believe you, I still believe you're moving, and I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working all things for good. Yeah, so I fix my eyes. Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive, oh, come alive in the name of Jesus. We come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to you, everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything. Come on, do you believe him to be the God of miracles tonight? You're the God of miracles. Come on, put a name on that miracle right now. Get a picture of what you believe in God for. You're the God of miracles. 
God a miracle. Just confess that. You're the God of miracle. You're the God of miracles. Yes, you are. We believe you are. To the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracle. We sing, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. So we bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Yes, it is. Yeah. We're getting ready to sing a song that really requires you to have faith. It's one that we know very well. But you got to really believe by faith that he is the God of miracles. Before you believe, he can turn graves into gardens. Anybody believe that he's still doing miracles today? Let's lift this song as a, as a declaration tonight. Let's lift it up and let him know just what we believe him to be. The God of miracles tonight. Lord, we confess that that's who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you tonight. Oh, I search the world. Come on, lift it up. But it couldn't fill. But it couldn't fill me. Oh, man's empty prayers and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. He put me back together. Yeah. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Let's lift the roof off this place tonight and declare. To oh, there's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing. Thank you, Lord. Nothing is better than you. I believe it's true. There's nothing better than you, Lord. Oh, and I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, to show you my weakness. My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Oh, because the God of the mountain. Oh, there's nothing. It's better. 
you turn morning to you turn morning to dancing you give beautiful ashes you turn shame into glory cause you're the Wednesday night. I'm ready for the weekend. I don't know about you. Go and be blessed. We'll see you there, church. Thank you for joining us for service today. We love that we get to serve you and your family. If you would like to continue your worship experience through giving, we have three simple, quick, and secure ways for you to do so. First, you can use text to give Simply compose a text message with the keyword thechapel.cc, followed by your gift amount to 77977. Hit send and follow the prompts. Or visit our website, thechapel.cc slash give and complete your giving online. Finally, you can always mail in your giving to the chapel at 1324 Seven Springs Boulevard, suite number 363, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34655. Thank you for your continued generosity. We could not and would not want to do this without you.